Good morning again. Um, here we are, the three consulting amigos, Ron, Ed, and myself. And today we wanted to talk a little bit about something that's near and dear to our heart, which is all of us are uh, either beyond retirement age or have approached the retirement age. And in the United States today, we have what has been defined by many people as a, quote, silver tsunami. And what that literally means is we have this demographic of those of us who were born after World War II to, to fathers who were uh, serving then, you know, are now leaving the workforce. And we are the largest group of people that have ever moved through America in that short amount of time. And one of the challenges that, you know, we've been talking about and we continue to talk about is what do we do about those people who are leaving who have all these skills, who have all years of experience and understand things and replace them with a smaller group of people who have not been trained in that way. So having started it that way, uh, which one of you wants to take uh, kind of move from their own experience on this? <laughs> well, I guess I guess um, I fit into that demographic and I have sort of moved on. Um, but the, the the interesting thing is I'm uh, the, the vast I'm sort of the early part as you are. You, you actually beat me in terms of boomers. You're one of the you're the I think the very first or the second year. I'm, I'm a year or two later than that. So we're on the front edge. And, um, you know, our generation has been retiring now for five, six, seven years. Yeah. And the ones who happen to be in sort of one of these 55 and out kind of jobs, which are not very often in small business, but um, those people have been retiring for a long time. I know people who have been retired for 10, 12 years my age already. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what they've done with their time, but um, uh, some of them just get new jobs. The, the, and of course, that's part of the issue is what do they do and can they really help the, the economy or, or are they just checked out? Uh, so when we take a look at this, this overall thing, it's something that dem demographers have known was going to happen for a long time. Uh, businesses have known this is going to happen. I, do small business understand or know it? I, I don't know. Newer ones probably haven't even thought anything about it. I've been involved in organizations where uh, the 30 somethings are kind of in the in late 20s are kind of going, you know, these old fossils, uh, we don't really want them hanging out. We don't we don't want their wisdom. They don't really know anything. Uh, so it doesn't really matter. But it does matter in the sense that um, they're competing now for the younger ones who maybe are great with social media or or with uh, computers or analysis or something that's a little bit kind of a newer technology that the baby boomers may not have been as, as proficient at as a whole. Um, so, I mean, it affects everybody. Certainly, it affects everybody. And the question now is, with after COVID, that it has pushed those who might have been 62, uh, 63, 64, out of the market three or four years earlier, now we really do have a tsunami because we're right. into the we're not quite in the middle of it yet, but we we're at least a third of the way in, which represents yeah. uh, maybe a third to forty percent of all boomers. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd like to take the perspective following up on buying a business and selling a business. Um, all these uh, there's a lot of businesses that are going to be going up for sale because um, of the age of the owner. And uh, so therefore, um, someone's got to be open to buying these businesses and continuing them. Otherwise, uh, we're going to lose out on some real good franchises that are out there that are taking care of people's needs that won't be able to continue. So I, I believe that uh, it's hard to find uh, what I'm hearing from people that are trying to sell their businesses or find someone to run their businesses, it's hard to find someone nowadays that has the work ethic of this group. This, this group uh, of people started these businesses and worked very, very hard over a long period of time to create something special. And um, they, they look at someone trying to come in and trying to run the business and they, they expect to um, you know, work 40 hours a week or 35 hours a week. And it just doesn't uh, keep the business moving forward. So that's another issue I think I'd like to throw into the pot here is the work ethic 
uh, of the of, of the next generation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd I'd uh, I'd like to push back a little bit on that. I think you know um, I, I looking at uh, your son um, Eric. I mean, uh, uh, who's the son that has the, the pool business? Ben. Yeah, Ben. You no, know, I mean Ben. Ben has developed his business and worked hard. He's part of that that younger generation. Well, right? but he's not that he's not that young anymore. Are we talking about? Uh, he's yeah, actually he's, he's forty five, right? He's a, he's a millennial. And, right. You know, we've got the millennials, the X's, and now the Y's, and the Y's are twenty three, twenty four. Right. So what, what? Who are you talking about, Ed? Oh, I'm talking about people. Um, you know, you want to put somebody in in their early forties. Uh, maybe late thirties that willing to take the business on. And um, I'm just telling you from my experience uh, working with uh, entrepreneurs that have businesses that right now that they'd like to, to take on to the next or push on to the next generation. They're having a hard time finding people that are willing to work like they did. Oh and yeah. Invest, okay. Well, and invest their capital. Yeah. So I think Ray Ray is right. There are good examples, and Ray's son Justin is another example. You know, in, in, my son Matthew. Yeah, I mean, just you know, a lot of hard, hard workers there. Um, but we're coming from a we're coming from a you know sort of a white Anglo-Saxon world. They would say the woke mm -hmm. people would say, yeah, but look at the advantages that they had, and um, therefore. Uh, you guys don't count. Now, I, I don't know if that's, is that true or is that not true? Um, when you when you try to label hard work as something that is um, um, a, a, a racial thing or a cultural thing, I, th I think that, I think you get way off base because take a look at the Indians today. I'm talking about the, the Asian Indians. They are at the top, top of the earning scale in the United States. Yeah, they're young, uh, sometimes younger than the 40s. They come cred credentialed with good educations. They're hard workers. So this idea that hard work has anything to do with culture, I mean, it may have to do with, say, families, but mm -hmm. it doesn't have it shouldn't have anything to do with culture. So the question is, do we really have a workforce that is just not willing to work as hard as we have in the past. And, and I tend to agree, Ed, I, I see that and I feel that, but I feel like it's a little bit, it's the, the millennials, I have two sons who claim to be millennials and one who can't push himself into that. And, and he says, well, he was raised as a millennial and that's why he's a hard worker. But really they're pushing down and they're saying, no, it's the, it's the Y generation. They're the problem. They're the ones who are lazy and they're the ones who don't yeah, want to Right, right. And it's always somebody else. <laughs> yeah. So that break now is about 30, about 39 or 38. And so I think when you go underneath there, that's a stereotype that um, certainly exists. Yeah. And, um, and is it true or or not? And and I think my point, Ron, is that I think it's a bit unfair. I, I think it's always a way that we, as the older generation, push back on the younger. Here, you know, what I'd really like to show you is this article on the silver tsunami, and the, and the real concerns that we have is that there are there are three major impacts that are happening as we leave the workforce. One, there's a lack of skilled labor. You know, yes. secondly, there's a lack of available workers and there's a lot loss of industry knowledge. All three of those things have nothing to do with somebody's work ethic. They have a, an awful lot to do with the fact that young people never had the opportunity to do blue collar skilled work that we had. And so as a consequence, we have a smaller group of people taking up a large group of, of uh, jobs and, and have never been trained the skills necessary to make that happen. So I think that can be construed sometimes. And your point, Ed, is that they're lazy. But the fact of the matter is, uh, no, I think been I, this thing's getting a little bit off kilter. I was talking about business owners running businesses. I'm not talking about skilled labor. I'm talking about people that are are working a lot of hours to to grow a business that's their own, and to find somebody who's willing to step in and do what they do. And put their um, their their capital to work. Um, it, it's it's not that easy. So I, I, what my comments have to do with selling a business more than anything else. Well, and let, let me go back and touch those three points again. 
if you've established a business and it's running and it's, um, it's doing a, an effective job now, and you're trying to sell the business, and you can't find people who have the skills to be able to run it, and they don't have the, the available information, and they don't have industry knowledge, what's the likelihood that that person can buy that business and successfully keep it moving forward? Yeah, I, I, I agree. It'd be tough. Yeah, it would be, be very difficult. And, and, and there are those, there are those who can um, work really hard and, ne and never gain those skills or never, never gain what it takes in order to be, to, to be able to make that business work. Um, right. And so, yeah, they do, they do tend to go together a little bit. <clears throat> and I don't know if we, if it's, if it's an ethical thing, or it's a skills based thing, or really, really what it is offhand, I do know for sure, um, that we've talked about this many times, that um, our, our political leaders, our educational leader, leaders, somehow have magically in their wisdom decided that there won't be any, any jobs in the future that require skills other than computer skills, and maybe high, high level thinking. Uh, well, how wrong could they have been about that? And so now, all around the country, we have we we and most and most of California shut down all all of our high school um, hands-on kind of kind of programs. And so, yes, we're having a huge skill shortage, and that's because our leaders simply made a mistake. Our, the governor of California on, uh, only a few years ago, previous, made it very clear everybody's going to junior college before they go on and get a four-year degree and then a master's, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't know uh, where he missed the class about statistical um, bell curves, but you know, not everybody is, is, is really capable or interested in going to college. Or should go to college. Or should, exactly. And that's why they shouldn't go is because right. they don't have, you know, co college is only good at the, these academic things uh and, and say plus engineering which is still at an academic level in most cases and they have a disconnect right. on the hands-on part right. but it's turning out that we we can't rely on the rest of the world to do the hands-on stuff no no we and i think that's some of that ourselves right and i think one of the challenges that we see is that and this is certainly not the responsibility of the people who are doing the work you know, consider the fact that so many businesses decided to increase their bottom line. The best way to do that is to outsource all their manufacturing where they could get it done cheaper and come back and raise their profits. Yeah, now, certainly that was good for profits, but it certainly impacted all the young people who didn't see a future, even if they wanted it, mm -hmm. you know, because there were not as many jobs available in that area. It's funny, I have a, a a grand nephew who we just met with, and he works for a company in Green Bay, Wisconsin called KI, and they manufacture furniture, high-end furniture for the school industry, et cetera. And it's been amazing to me to see, you know, having watched my brother grow up as a, um, a, a machinist and know all these skills and understand what it took, but, but that was popular back then. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it was it was common for people to go into our wood shops and our machine shops, et cetera, and come out and actually work on apprenticeships. Yeah, I think we need to move back to that model, you know, yeah. and I think we are here in California to some degree, but obviously there's not enough people to make it happen. Yeah, we're just I think we're, ones, you we're know, just starting to see that happen in California now and maybe others are ahead. Um, but the junior college have now have now realized that they they have made a colossal mistake. We mentioned this in our manufacturing conversation a, a week ago or so. That um, uh, you know the manuf we the, the manufacturers have been talking about this for a decade, and and it's now now finally we're seeing the educators realize oh maybe we made a mistake. So this is this is a sort of a high level governmental um, kind of a push a direction from those who who knows what their agenda is, who really thought that we're gonna have globalism and not, gee, what could go wrong with this? And, um, you know, not to get off, off kilter at all, but I mean, look what has gone wrong with globalism uh, with just a few interruptions. There are a bunch of problems with that. And now we realize we, we need to have some of these skills at home again. Yeah. But more, yeah. Than, more than that, if we don't have those skills, 
I've heard it said that as many as a third of our people won't be able to work because there won't be anything for them to do. That's a problem too. Yeah, no, that is. And one of the things I'm reading here that uh, Deloitte predicts, uh, because there's a, there's an element of what Ed said that certainly rings true. But I think one of the other things that we've seen in this younger workforce, you know, the Gen Z and the millennials, is they're not content to work in a single job as many of our parents and we were. You know, they'll they'll change jobs over and over again. And what that amounts to is that for a, a workforce or an employer, it means it's disruptive because there's a lot more turnover than they had anticipated because people are leaving to look for a better position. And then, of course, there's the idea of quiet quitting in which people are there, but you'd be better off if they weren't. <laughs> yeah, right. What do you think? Um, do, do you think that the, the COVID led, but I'm not sure it's COVID, it's the underlying issue, but this transition from people away from cities to more rural areas, um, I have sort of wondered why that wasn't happening uh, for a long time. Uh, and now it's happening. And now we're, we're seeing some cities hollowed out uh, to, to a small degree, enough, enough to kind of change, change the economy. Um, and of course, we have all these other problems that are evident primarily in cities to have to deal with um, not, only, not only disease, but the homeless, really rough construction circumstances, just putting people in, in, together in cities um, seems to have forced people to think, I don't need a job that pays me quite as well if I can have a better lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't blame people of any age who basically say, I'm tired of the rat race. Mm. Um, may, I like my job, but I don't like the hour and a half commute each way. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, can I do something else that's enjoyable enough, make a living, mm -hmm. retire in a lower cost place uh, when I'm finished up? Uh, maybe, maybe this urban thing's not all that it's that it's cracked up to be. Is that part of what we're seeing? I mean, just this lifestyle, this realization that lifestyles could be better is that part of I'm, it? I'm seeing right now people leaving california for that for that very reason mm -hmm. yeah and you know, they can't they can't buy a house here um they can move to the midwest they can um with with the technology now they can do their jobs at just about anywhere and uh they can live a, a better lifestyle they don't enjoy the weather over there but uh but by the same token they can own their own house and um, they have uh, personal freedoms that they don't have here in California, whereas it's really hard to survive. I think that's well, a good point, Ron. You know, the, the think, interesting thing about California is that the, it's a good thing the weather is nice is because most people live in pretty small houses. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and some of them are not that great a neighborhood and you, you're a little bit concerned about crime. I mean, there are a lot of people in the middle class that are absolutely scared to death to go outside in, in the in Southern California, not every place, obviously, um, but that's a big issue. And so, with this with this trend, you can see how there are a whole lot of of ambitious, hardworking um, kids. We'll call them under thirty nine, who um, you know might just be saying, you know, I, I just I can't continue to live like this. I want to spend time with my kids. You know, I want to do a little traveling. I want to do, I, I want to take a break in the middle of the day and go to lunch with yeah. somebody. And you know, I'll, I'll put in my eight hours, nine hours, but I'm not, uh, or 10 hours, but I just want flexibility again. I don't want to feel like somebody put me in a capsule. And for crying out loud, you know, you go to a downtown office, it's so, the rent is so expensive. They're, you know, people are, who are making $150,000 are in cubicles for crying out loud. Yeah, yeah. It used to be that we had offices for people making 150,000 or 80,000 or 70,000. You know, I mean, what has happened here? And I think you kind of have to go, maybe, and I think that my kids have done this and maybe yours too, but maybe the boomers didn't have it right. Maybe we need to do something different. Yeah. Yeah, and I think um, there's a great book out there that's kind of scary, but it's how the boomers stole the future from the younger kids. You know? Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah. You know, and, and so there's a lot of pushback against us for having not prepared well, them for what needs to be done in the future. Yeah. You know, I'll give you an example again, using my, my grand nephew, but you know, he bought a home in Green Bay, Wisconsin. It's a three bedroom brick home with a completely filled basement across the street from a, a wonderful park for $90,000. Well, yeah. wow. well, that's yeah. exactly the point I was trying to make. Yeah, yeah. And um, that's something we got to consider. But I want to bring up another point, and that is the younger generation is they have put us basically um, out of out of business from one perspective. They know how to operate computers. They're on. They understand technology much better than guys our age. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a lot of respects, even though we know how to run a business and we work hard and and we keep uh, we keep getting our business going and, and and making it profitable. They know how to use technology, and we don't, for the most part. Mm -hmm. And everything's being digitized right now, and it's putting us, uh, our generation, uh, we're becoming uh, obsolete. Yeah, that yeah. perspective. It's 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 definitely true, and of course there are exceptions to that. People who who have been involved in technology, for instance, or they've learned along the way they have to use computers. But you know, it's it's not like an extension of your hand, and and, and it really kind of is an extension of people's people's hands when they're that age. They it's just a tool, and they just use it, and it seems natural to them. And, and I think that it's it's creeping in every it's everywhere. Um, I had an electrician come into my house to do a, what I thought was going to be some simple wiring and the house is 100 years old and, you know, things are not exactly the way they should be. And I couldn't not believe the equipment that he used to very easily and quickly figure out where everything was going. Yeah. It's like, wow, you know. This guy, this guy is is an electrician, and he's also a high tech guy. Okay, same thing happened in plumbing. the The plumbing guy comes in, and they take a look at this, and and the the plumbing has just been all over the place. And how are you going to find? Oh, we can fo follow that. Well, how do you do that? We're using ground penetrating radar. <laughs> what? Yeah. what there you go see so i mean you know you, you say hands-on but it means more than digging ditches yeah, the yeah exactly. the ditch? sure but he's also running lidar to be able to find the plumbing in about 10 minutes that would have taken a backhoe 20 years ago yeah so yeah. you know there is an efficiency in all of this stuff yeah, and right. the question would be well you know, at what point did us did us old guys go? I don't know how to run that new computer stuff. I think it's time for me to retire. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why I think it's a great opportunity for younger folks, and we've been talking about this, and uh, and it ties into microgiants is having the younger folks take some of these old established businesses mm -hmm. and modernize them and, yeah. and make them uh, more digital. Yeah, freshen them up, uh, add freshen them up. I, I think it's a great opportunity, and uh, we can help coach. And they have the ingenuity to to pull this off. We can help maybe finance these opportunities for them. So right, there's a good transition from the old to the new. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think you know the point that uh, you were making, Ron, by using your house as an example, is that you cannot outsource plumbers, electricians uh carpenters etc you know these are really? these are trades that are going to continue to be needed here yeah and and they are the smart ones as uh, ed has been alluding to you know have started their own businesses and use the latest technology to be able to move it forward oh and yeah is yeah. you were and I, i've been astounded to have some of these guys come in and see the equipment that they use that that that, that when I was doing this, there was, you know, there was the old fashioned grease, uh, you know, elbow yeah. grease. That was what you used to get something done. That's right. That is right. It's amazing to see. Uh, and, and it's fun. It's fun to see these advances in these non computer areas uh, that, that are, you know, equipment and or computer in conjunction right. electro. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. So I would say, uh, you know, we we can kind of summarize this. I think, you know, we we've talked about several issues. One of them was 
we really missed on a national basis on this skill thing. So that's yeah. that's part of part of this silver sneakers, you know, tsunami leaving kind of thing. And 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 then the the other one would be several of these issues that caused some of us to retire early, maybe. Um, and you had had three three items. I think you were right on Ray. What were those three items that I, I uh, the three items that are that are really um, a major major issue are that you don't we don't have the skilled labor. I mean, in yeah. other words, the number of people leaving the marketplace between now and two thousand and thirty, right? And the lack of available workers. You know, clearly that is, and no industry knowledge. You know, since you know the the three things that we talked about in manufacturing, it's not so much your I mean, it's not the intellectual capacity as much as it is the knowledge of what to do and how to do it. You know, and yeah. if you're working with some of your clients, you see these younger people really don't have and have never been encouraged to get those skills. Yeah. They can adapt quickly, but it still is, and yeah. you know, they have to adapt, which is right. not what they've yeah. been trained to do. Yeah, you're right. That's the third the third thing. And and I would just add to that, um, there are too many small business people that have um uh gone through the quote downsizing where they got cut their middle managers out this is kind of your point that we've talked about for years cut the middle managers out and they did not train people to come up the ladder uh right. that's the fault of the ownership and i and so i think they each each of these groups takes a little little bit of the blame here right yeah, i i got i saw a great cartoon the other day where you have uh 10 people in a picture and you have uh, you have a finance person, you have all these supervisors, you have the CEO, and you got one guy digging a ditch. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and when they talk about cutting costs, yeah. guess what person they want to cut? Yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. I think yeah. you're talking about most of our county county people. Uh, that's yeah. kind of what I see around here: four people watching one guy work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, and it's and it's true. You know, I mean, uh, we've all at some point in our past, you know, done manual labor and, and to a varying degree. And you know, as a what I found uh, when I moved to Alaska to work on the Trans Alaska Pipeline, I was an executive with Bechtel Corporation. You know, helping manage reports and all that stuff. And my ex-wife went out and worked on the on the pipeline as a laborer, and she was making three times as much a week as I was. <laughs> there you go. There you it go. It didn't take yeah. me long to realize maybe this is the road I need to go because I'm not up here for a career move. I'm up here to make some money. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right. That's right. So. And, and a lot of the lot a lot of the uh, the business owners that I work with, um, they do spend a tremendous amount of time in their business. Yes. And uh, I, I really don't know if that's the right approach or not, but I, I, I know one in particular, he spends over 100 hours. He's in his 60s. He's spent, spending over 100 hours a week running his business. Yeah. And to find someone who's willing to make that type of commitment is very difficult. Yeah. Well, um, well and let me it, make it, an it observation is. on that. Yeah, uh, and, right. Do you think a guy who's working 100 hours a week is really working smart? You know, right. the truth of the matter is he doesn't have enough labor, so he's doing it all himself. And the biggest issue in, in terms of selling your business is can this business run without you? Well, that's, clearly, you guys oh, yeah, yeah week, that's, that's the challenge. And uh, yeah, his the business can't run without him. That's the problem. Yeah. yeah. And um, uh, the other thing is he's doing it. Part of what he's doing, he likes doing it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if he yeah. didn't like doing it, he wouldn't be doing it. Yeah. No, no, that's that's true. And but, then if he when he sells his business, all of a sudden he won't have those hundred hours a week. What's he gonna do? Yeah. And well, and maybe these young money. people are coming along and looking at him and going, you know what, you're crazy. You you <laughs> yeah. this yeah. business. I mean, it's like if yeah. there's anything we know, the value of the business goes up by 50% when it can run without the owner. No yeah. smart investor is gonna buy a job that requires him to work a hundred hours a week. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, I, no, I mean, that's that's so part of this silver tsunami is that, you know, because guys didn't figure out how to run a business without them, they are going to that's why 80 percent of them are just going to close their doors. Well, right. that's probably so. But that's reality. And that's what yeah. we're dealing with. And uh, well, and, and, I still you know, think as an opportunity for younger folks to take on these businesses. Yes. And um, yeah, yeah it, modernize it, 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 them. 
It is. Well, but and I think to, I just want to say this, and we're about, about to run out of time because I know uh, Ron needs to leave. But the, the point you made, Ed, that I think is so valuable, there is information and knowledge and skills that you, the three of us and others that we can attract can bring to that young person to fill yeah. the gap so they can buy the business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they successfully. Yeah, that's right. So we think they don't work hard enough, possibly. They think that uh, we're outdated. And in reality, if we work together, we could create something special. Hey, you know, maybe this better together is an idea. Maybe. Yeah, collaboration, right? Okay, so that will we be all our bring solution. something to the party. That's our yeah. solution for the for the topic right there. So yeah. many times when you're dealing with a business problem, just putting it on a piece of paper with a pen can really help you solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And um, but uh, the younger folks, they look at it differently, right? They they got spreadsheets and they got all the new technology. Mm -hmm. But in reality, a lot of the same concepts work. It's just different. Yeah. Yeah. And I can I want to cite an example. The reason I use the better together. Uh, we at our church have been trying to merge with this other church that's been in existence for 70 years. They own the church. There's uh, five acres of land. There's money involved. And we uh, that church only has 32 members. And it just went down to 30 members. Yeah. And we just brought in 150 people. And yet there are so many of them that say, well, I don't know if I want to do this. <laughs> and and my point to this, Ed, in terms of business, is we have the same problem. You got a guy working 100 hours a week, and he's not sure he wants to bring somebody in. Yeah. No, I think he wants to bring somebody in, but the problem is he wants somebody that's like him. <laughs> right. That works a lot of hours, and right. I, I I don't think people nowadays younger folks want to work 100 hours a week and, and right. i'm not saying that's right or wrong i i don't know but well i i, I mean i can reasonable. only say from my experience that any business that requires 100 hours a week is is not operated by a smart operator well <laughs> so there's, it, a, it, there's a lot of cpas yeah. that had businesses they work 100 hours a week yeah they they enjoy it it's more than a job to them yes that's true. I, yeah. I think one of the things that we've seen over and over again is that the truth is that in most small businesses, including mine and Ron's and, and yours, Ed, is it's not just about the job. It's it's kind of an outreach for who we are. It's it's yeah. a it's a it's kind of our purpose. I, well, I think though if, if you research it, you'll find that the, the people that grew up in that generation, that's they were used to working a lot of hours. Yeah. Well, and, yeah, and and of course that work ethic is sometimes synonymous and probably incorrectly so with the idea that a lot of work means you're doing a good good work. But but in truth, as Ray, Ray said, um, you know, working smart is not a bad way to work. Um, well, it, it's what, the only what way is, to go. What Absolutely. the point? Yeah, what the point really is is that you need to work as little as possible and create as, yeah, as value. Well as much wealth and value for the company and the customers and the employees as you can right. uh, and and not and not go overboard use those extra hours to develop another business or to bring somebody along or you know do something different with those hours but don't run your business on 100 hours because yes. that frankly is not a smart smart strategy i think we all agree with that yeah. and you know this and we've heard this this is an old uh it might be a uh, bromide, but you know, working on your business is a lot more important than working in your business. That's yeah. correct. That's uh, correct. So, um, with that, guys, uh, I know you got to leave, Ron. I think this was an interesting topic, and I uh, appreciate everybody's input on this. So um, go out and, and make it a great day, Ron. And Ed, we'll see you later. <laughs> Have a good weekend. It's Veterans Day, and uh, I want to salute all the veterans out there who might be listening and thank them for their service. Amen. Amen.